is Mike Gaben, and welcome to my KSP campaign. Uh, you know, my, my rocket launches of late have been starting to get bigger, and although I haven't quite pushed the limits of the current launch pad, I thought it would be best to start the upgrading process. Yeah, I can afford here the $423,000 for this upgrade. So we'll get that started. And then that way I'll be a little bit proactive and this will fully upgrade the launch pad so that I will have no limit on uh, the size of my vessels that I'm launching. So that'll be pretty exciting. And then it's going to be just a quick time warp to the next day to recondition the launch pad and to get ready for the launch, the next launch of the Kerstock 5. And you can see this time actually Kerstock 5 is crewed. We got our newest Kerbinop partner. And we actually have a couple of contracts we're going to fulfill, but we're going to start off with one of the contracts is to test this engine, the HDR FG90 from Homegrown Rockets. We're going to test this on the surface, an easy one to do. So I just turned the thrust right down to zero. Then I'm just going to isolate that engine in the staging. Normally it wouldn't turn on till higher in the atmosphere, but uh, you know we can we can do this right here. I think it should just work just with some staging. There it goes. All right, and now let's see here. We got to, I got to shut down this engine. Yeah, yeah, don't turn up the thrust now. <laughs> Threat down this engine, then we can turn up the thrust and then we'll put the engine back in where it belongs in the staging. And there, now we should be able to launch normally. So there we go, there's one contract done. And what we're gonna be doing, we got a few things we're gonna do at the same time. We're gonna rendezvous with Duna 1. Um, because Duna 1 has a busted battery and we're gonna send Bartner up there he's gonna fix it turns out you don't need any experience at all to fix batteries which really can't make sense and I want to take a look at the action group manager here because well I don't want to get into it but the action groups on the on the parachutes that are on the boosters the SRBs are is messed up and it was causing the parachutes not to deploy when I stage them, but it doesn't seem like the action group manager is working right here. So, uh, yeah, I'm gonna put that away. I guess you gotta try it in flight. And so then we'll just uh, time warp until Duna 1 is in position so that we can uh, rendezvous with it. Duna 1 is in an orbit, an 80 kilometer orbit. Um, so, what we're gonna do is we're going to just launch ahead of it. So, I'm just gonna time warp so We'll just be a little bit ahead of it, so it shouldn't be too long. That looks about right there. Yeah, we're going to launch into a higher orbit. Duna 1's in an 80-kilometer orbit, so we're going to go into a 100-kilometer orbit, and then that's going to allow Duna 1 to catch up to us and allow us to do our rendezvous. So, we are pretty much ready to go, so let's punch it. All right, well, let's get the action group manager going again. See if I can now fix the action groups on those parachutes on those SRBs. Everything's still dead here. Oh, how does this, what's this button do? R, what's that? An S and an R, R. AGM recap. Okay, that just kind of tells me what, what we all got. S, settings. Okay. None of this is useful. I, I guess you gotta be in orbit or something. Oh shoot, the uh, main engine didn't uh, didn't fire there. Okay, stage. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> no, I just staged the orbiter. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> this isn't gonna work, it work. <laughs> ah! <laughs> okay, decouple that. Decouple, there we go. Decouple the escape tower, parachutes, parachutes, parachutes. There. Oh, well, there we go. Oh, well, at least the abort system worked. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, well, all of this could have... Oh, boom. <laughs> uh, nothing like falling with explosions. Well, that could have gone better. <laughs> Didn't even get a chance to talk about Selfie. Selfie. Selfie is a tourist... Wanted to go suborbital. I don't think this counts. <laughs> oh well, at least the abort system worked. That was my first surprise use of the abort system. And it worked! They survived. Uh, Zelfie doesn't seem to mind. 
I think she just knows that she's just not going to have to pay for this. She's going to get herself another ride. Anyway, we'll obviously have to try that one again at another time. But uh, a couple of days later, it was time to check in on how ComSat-1 was doing. Remember, ComSat-1 is going to be one of three communication satellites about the moon. And what I'm checking in on uh, is its phase angle relative to JunkSat-2. Right now, its phase angle is about 257 degrees. And what I want is for that phase angle to get down to about 240 degrees. And it's getting, it's getting pretty close. And with its orbital period about half an hour longer than JunkSat-2's orbital period, it's gaining about 15 degrees um, every rotation. So what I want to do is I want to bring their orbital periods closer. So I'm just going to burn retrograde a little bit, get the orbital period of ComSat-1 to be only about 10 minutes um, longer than JunkSat-2. Now it's only going to be uh, gaining about 5 degrees per orbit. Uh, so, you know, after another two or three orbits, we should be getting pretty close to inserting this guy into its final position. At the beginning of this video, I mentioned that I am sort of getting towards the upper bounds of the mass limit for this particular launch pad, and this 100 ton beastie is a perfect example of that. Yeah, it was a few episodes ago that I launched the uh, space station that the Korion is currently docked with, and uh, you might recall at that time I kind of mentioned that the space station had enough fuel aboard to refuel the Korion twice. Yeah, that, that's not true. I don't know what I was thinking about. I, I must have just... No, it, it could refuel the Korion once. So, once the Korion returned from its mission to... Um, uh, it uh, refueled ComSat-1 so it could be sent out on its way, it, it requires another refueling to have it be able to perform the next mission that I have in mind, which I will get to before this video is over. So... That necessitated the launching of, well, this is a fuel barge. There's nothing else about it. it it's just a big, big thing of fuel. It's using the exact same lifter that the uh, habitat module for the space station used. In fact, it's, it's actually a remarkably similar vessel. All it is is basically that same vessel with uh, the hitchhiker can removed and some of the other space station-y stuff removed and, like, life support junk, and uh, it replaced instead with more fuel cans. Anyway, this particular ascent and rendezvous went without, unlike the previous one, any complications or problems. Everything went according to plan, so why don't we just cut to our encounter with the Kerbin Station. Now, one oversight that I made when I was slapping this thing together was that I forgot to put any monoprop on this thing. And, uh, yeah, that was a kind of a dopey mistake for two reasons. Number one was, well, the Korion, although it's not really low on monoprop, not, not anywhere dangerously low anyway, um, it does use monoprop, so it would have been good to bring some up to just sort of top up the tanks. Uh, and number two, of course, now this thing has no RCS on it. Uh, which means that uh, it has no maneuvering and, you know, I might have potentially been able to dock this with the station. There is a free docking port on the curse dock that is connected to the station. But, you know, without the RCS, I'm not going to go for it. Now, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to bring it up alongside and then Glafi is going to get out there with the good old KAS docking or er, pipe endpoints to connect it with a fuel line uh, to the station. Um, oh, that's, uh, that kind of just went right into the texture there, didn't it? Besides, I do have a better plan for the docking ports. Um, I'm going to swipe them. I, I, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to use these docking ports and try and make this station a little more docking friendly. So we're going to take the docking port from the, uh, from the fuel barge. And actually there's a barometer here too that I'm going to take. And that is a uh, part of a science gathering mission that I have come up. I have a plan for use for this particular barometer. And well, you know, while we're at it, why don't we take a few batteries too? I mean, you know, waste not, want not. So anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to take the docking port and we're going to attach it radially to the space station to provide a docking point for some, some future vessel. 
And then what we'll go out is we'll go out to the curse dock and get its docking port. Ooh. Ooh, that doesn't that doesn't look right. Well, maybe I should deal with this first. Yeah, somehow that pipe endpoint seems to have come off. That's really weird. I don't know if it's connected or not, but I think maybe readjusting this would be okay, it's too far. I think I'd best reconnect this. A little closer. Still too far. It's kind of hard to judge the distance when it's not on the ship. It's kind of just floating out here. Come on. Okay. I got to be close enough now. Oh, there we go. Got it. Okay. So we'll pull that over there. And it seemed to not want to connect to the engine. So what I did is I ended up turning the fuel barge around so that the uh, probe body was pointing straight towards the station and it connected to that just fine. So that solved that problem. So let's get back to stealing the cursed docks docking port. And the plan for this docking port is the same as with the other one. I'm going to attach it radially to the space station, of course, on the opposite side from the previous docking port. I thought sort of briefly that maybe I'll dock the cursed dock to the station using the docking port that I got from the fuel barge, but then, then I would have no more free docking ports left and I do have another vessel that's coming up here that you'll see in this vet in this video um, for a future mission. And if I did that, then I'd have no more free docking ports for that vessel. And the curse dock really is kind of fine where it is. And remember that this curse dock has no maneuvering thrusters on it, so docking with it would be kind of a pain. So I thought, no, no, I'll leave it where it is, and uh, you know, keep some docking ports free. Anyway, with that accomplished, it was just a simple matter of transferring almost all of the fuel out of the fuel barge, just leaving enough of it, enough fuel behind so that it would be able to deorbit itself, and then it was just a simple matter of disconnecting it. Burning a little bit retrograde to deorbit this thing, leaving me with a fully fueled Corian all ready for its next mission. But before we get talking about that mission, I do have a couple of other things that I want to show you. The first of which is actually has to do with the mission after the next mission that I have planned for the Karayan, which is to make a manned landing on either the moon or the Minmus. And the idea is for the Karayan to take a lander out to either of those two bodies and to drop the lander. I'd really want to make this a two-person lander. And this is my first kick at this, but... Uh, what I want to show you is a feature that's in Kerbal construction time, and that is that you don't have to always start your simulations from Kerbin surface. Once you've entered into the sphere of influence of something for real, uh, you can start running simulations from there. So I selected the moon as my sphere of influence. I'm going to run my simulation for an hour. I'm going to start in an orbit with an altitude of 10 kilometers. So once I have that all set up and ready to go, of course, it's going to be more expensive. You can see here that this is all going to cost me in and around a couple of thousand curb bucks, but that's okay. Uh, but I hit the simulate button, and now it starts me in orbit. And that's when I discovered the flaw in this particular design, and that is that this two-person orbital module that comes from uh, homegrown rockets isn't a command module. I have absolutely no control of this vessel. I can't do anything. So, well, that was rather disappointing. So, but we'll cancel that. It's better to find that out now in simulation where it's only going to cost me a couple of thousand curb bucks than it is to actually get the thing out there and then find out that it doesn't work. So here is uh, design number two, which is taking use of the one man, or one woman, considering it's Valentina in there right now, the one person uh, landing module, the landing can. Um, I do have a bit of a restriction on this particular craft because um, the issue is, is that the Karayan has to drag it out there, and I'm a little bit concerned about mass because the Karayan only has so much pushing power, doesn't have unlimited delta V, so I wanted to keep the mass uh, under about three tons. I really wanted, to, uh, three tons was kind of in around my upper limit, and this guy's comfortably under there at 2.7 tons, which is nice, and it has about 1,500 meters per second of delta V, so what I thought I would do was, uh, I don't know, give it a trial, because it's only job, you know, Crying's going to take it out there, it's going to drop it off in orbit, so it needs to be able to drop down to the surface on orbit, or from orbit, land safely obviously, take off again, get itself back up into orbit where the Karayan can pick it up again. 
that's that's its job. So if it can do that, it's golden. So thought I would give it a go here. And uh, yeah, the whole thing went without any issues whatsoever. I landed it fairly easily, was able to get it back up, get it back up into orbit. And then, uh, you know, it, it worked pretty well. So, oh, that's a that's a pretty view right there. I like that. I'm gonna st I, I didn't quite push this into the building queue just yet because I do have some other things I want to take care of. But uh, this thing should be coming up sometime in the near future. In the meantime, we will time warp to the completion of the upgrade on the tracking station. This fully upgrades the tracking station, which means now I can start to track asteroids. So uh, that should give me, that should open up some more contract opportunities and for future episodes. And then I'm going to go to one more thing before we go to the final mission, and that is to just quickly show you the final insertion of JunkSat 3. Uh, into its orbit around the moon to act as a communication satellite. Yeah, I like ComSat 1 that you saw a little bit earlier in the video. The idea of this is to form a communication network. Um, but for that, I need it to be in the proper position, and I'm closing in on that now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to time warp, because I got it pretty much in the right phase angle. So I'm going to time warp till I have my altitude in the right position. What I'm shooting for is uh, 1250. Oh, it just went to 1256. That's close enough. Let's stop. 12. I wanted 1255, but 1256 is close enough. And I want a period of uh, two days or 12 hours. So what I'm going to do is uh, the period's just about right, but what the apoapsis is too high and the periapsis is too low. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be burning radially inwards to adjust the apoapsis and periapsis without affecting my period all too much. So the idea here, excuse me, is to bring down apoapsis, uh, bring up periapsis. I'm also at the same time burning a little bit prograde because I actually now that I see this, I can, I need to get my period up to two hours. And then once I have the periapsis and the apoapsis reasonably close together, close to being a circle, it's just some final tweaking on the period, and then this guy is pretty much there. Or at least so I thought. I was aiming for a phase angle of, a, of 120 degrees with JunkSat 2, and I can see here, or 120 degrees or 240 uh, degrees, they're, they're pretty much the same thing. And I can see here that I'm at 249 degrees. I don't know. I must have been just reading this wrong. I don't know what I was thinking about. Uh, I don't know. I might come back and tweak it, or I might just leave it. Taking a look at this right here, you can see that it actually looks okay. I'm basically shooting for an equilateral triangle here. Uh, JunkSat 3 is up there at the top right. JunkSat 2 is at the top left. And here, let's turn off the... Uh, target here so this will look a little better once there we go and comsat 1 is down there at the bottom and i th comsat 1's the only one that's not in the right orbit yet if it drifted it's going it's still drifting backwards so if it drifts backwards just a little bit yeah it should be okay we'll see i might come back and tweak it some more it certainly is going to be functional anyway and that brings us to another launch of the curse stock 5 let's see if i can get this into a little bit ooh the moon yeah, that's cool, because that is actually the destination for Carol and Bill here. They will be on their way to the moon. Not in this particular vessel, but uh, I'll get to the mission in just a little bit. Let's get this thing off the ground. Whoa. The launch clamp Stage. Launch clamps didn't release. Whoa! Oh, no! Well, that's not good. Oh, I just lost my boosters. I know, I'm hearing lots of explosions. Okay, everything looks okay back there. Could have lost the lost the launch pad. That's I guess that must have been a staging issue. Clearly, I had the staging messed up. Oh great. Oh man, I'm kind of jinxed with the curse stocks in this video. Well, the hell with it. I'm going for it. We are going to get this thing, or at least try to get this thing into orbit. I'm not abandoning this mission just yet. And this mission is going to be about experience. If we take a look at Carol down here, we can see that Carol actually has five experience points. Five out of eight. 
eight's what she needs for the next level. Two are for her orbit around Kerbin, and three for her flyby of Minmus. She currently has one point for her current flight in Kerbin, but that one doesn't really count. In order for that one to count, she has to get more experience in Kerbin than the two that she already has in Kerbin's sphere of influence, but that's impossible. Two is actually the most you can get in Kerbin's sphere of influence. Okay, so this is a little bit confusing, so I think it's a little bit worth talking to, and it's actually why I picked Carol and Bill for this mission. Okay, the mission is going to be to do an orbit around the moon. I want to go into orbit around the moon with the Korion, and I want to... Uh, pick up EVAs over as many bi over all the rest of the biomes that are in or I'm going to put it in a polar over and get all the biomes and that's going to hopefully generate a lot of science so I can start doing some damage to the tech tree but also I want to get some of my Kerbals up to level 2 here's the problem let's say I put Bob on this mission now Bob has 4 experience points 2 for his orbit of round Kerbin and, and 2 for his flyby of the moon Let's say Bob was on this mission and he did an orbit around the moon. An orbit around the moon is three experience points. But for Bob, that would override the two experience points he already has earned in the moon's sphere of influence. So the two for his flyby of the moon would be gone, replaced by the three, giving him only five experience points. He only gained one from the orbit. However, for Carol and Bill, who have never been into the moon's sphere of influence, they're going to get the whole three for their orbit of the moon. So the three for the orbit of the moon, the three for their flyby of Minmus, and the two for their orbit around Kerbin that they've already earned gives them eight, which puts them at level two. They're the only two Kerbals that, that could go to level, that I have, that could have gone, that can go to level two with an orbit around the moon. So it's confusing. I find the experience system in Kerbal Space Program to be quite confusing. So you really do have to think about who you're going to pick to get the most out of the experience. In the meantime, we have reached our target apoapsis of 80 kilometers and uh, have had main engine cutoff. And I gotta say, I'm pretty impressed with the performance of this lifter. I thought I'd be out of fuel by the time I got up here, but I still have 281 meters per second still left in the ascent vehicle and the uh, lifter. So, ah, there may be hope for this yet. Alrighty, that ascent stage has just gone dry, so we'll separate. Now it's all up to the orbiter, all 355 meters per second that's left in the orbiter. Yeah, we're not out of the woods here yet, but I mean, worse comes to worse, and these guys don't make orbit. I mean, this, this capsule is free, can descend on its own as long as they don't crash into any mountains. These guys are going to be fine, so that's why I'm kind of comfortable with, with going for it. And uh, trying reasonably efficient but I don't know if I'm doing that good a job getting away from my prograde vector there we go okay apoapsis is now zero let's see if we can get that apoapsis out of the atmosphere okay shut off let it get close burn slow 50 kilometers 60 kilometers Almost out of the atmosphere. Oh no, eight meters per second left. Okay, that's it. We are out of liquid fuel and oxidizer. So now it's up to the RCS. So we'll just let ourselves get a little bit closer to Apoapsis once again. The only monoprop in this thing is in the capsule. So I have 20 units. Monoprop, and that's it. I do love these pop up RCS thrusters. I gotta check, you know, before I think I said these came from homegrown rockets, but now I'm thinking they might come from interstellar. I really do have to check. But a few puffs here, we now have a stable orbit. And we have 17.87, I think that's kiloliters of fuel left. But we're going to go for it anyway. So we'll just set up our transfer burn out to Kerbin Station. Yeah, it's looking all right. What? Gimbal failure. Gimbal failure. Oh, dang it. <laughs> That's dang it again. 
So we have a gimbal failure in the main engine. Well, the main engine's not doing very much right now, is it? That's kind of irrelevant. <laughs> so I can live with that. Um, it turned out I couldn't fix it anyway because I need to have a level 2 engineer in order to fix that. So we're just going to just ignore that particular warning and just go straight to our transfer. Unfortunately, I Kerbal Engineer does not give me how much Delta V I have left. So um, I really don't have a very good idea of the amount of Delta V I have, though I know I don't have much because I used pretty close to a quarter of my monoprop just in that little bit of circularization I did at the end of my orbit insertion. So, uh, yeah, it, it's not much, <laughs> that's for sure. And I honestly thought about, um, I thought for a second about uh, ditching the service module at this point. Because if I ditch the service module, I mean, there, then, I, then I'm no longer dragging this heavy engine around that is completely useless to me. Um, and that would probably increase the amount of Delta V I had quite substantially. Uh, I could have even taken a couple of the solar panels from it and stuck it onto the uh, command capsule, but I didn't do it for a couple of reasons. Number one is um, I didn't want to hobble this vessel. I want to keep this vessel intact. I don't want to end up messing it up. And the second thing is, is you know, worst comes to worst, I have a fully fueled Corian that can come and get these guys. So there really is no risk here. If I don't quite make it there, well... The, the crying can come get them all right so there we go 0.1 kilometers for closest approach and i have 9.35 kiloliters of the original 20 kiloliters of monoprop left less than half we'll <laughs> see how this goes um the plan is that uh, i think i'm going to try and leave it to as late as i dare to try and uh, match velocities with the station because uh, the later I leave it, I'm pretty sure the more efficient this is. Okay, I can see that my retrograde vector is drifting off the target, so I do want to get back in here. Ugh, I can, that monopropellant is disappearing quickly. It's getting my velocity, my target velocity down. I don't want to be too risky about this. Again, there's no need. There's no need to be a daredevil. There, you know, the worst thing would be to crash into this thing. Okay, here we go. And I'm intentionally going to keep the retrograde vector off of the target icon just a little bit because, you know, I don't want to run out of fuel and then run into the station. That would be bad. And that is it. I am dry. I am dry, and I brought my target velocity down to 7 meters per second. Well, that ain't so bad. So let's let's put us in a normal north-south orientation to uh, give the Karayan as easy job as it can, because now it's going to have to come after us. And of course, for Jeb and Glafia, this is getting to be pretty old hat. Rendezvousing with runaway vessels. Well, that's just their specialty, isn't it? So docking with the curse dock, no big deal. We can just need to turn around and get ourselves back. And while we were on our way back, it was a pretty simple matter to transfer some monopropellant back into the curse dock so that it can once again uh, maneuver on its own. So the Corian could then dock back with Kerbin Station, followed very closely thereafter by the curse dock. And while the curse dock finally does make its way over to the station, I do want to draw some attention to uh, the docking alignment indicator, in particular the docking port I'm aiming for. It's the starboard docking port. That's a really nice feature with docking alignment indicators. You can name your docking ports and then uh, cycle through them with those those arrow buttons so that it makes it really easy for you to make sure if you have multiple docking ports on a vessel that you're going for the one that you intend to go for. But anyway, with that finally accomplished, I don't know about you, but I was exhausted and I wasn't about to start to head off to the moon. So I'm going to be closing this episode off. We will be going out to the moon at the beginning of the next episode. So I thank you for watching. And I hope to see you next time.